The Home Tech Podcast is supported by you. To find out more, go to hometech.fm slash support. This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, January 18th from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. And from Denver, Colorado, I'm Jason Griffin. How are you doing, Seth? Pretty good. Pretty good, Jason. Um, I, I, I've got, I've, I've solved something for us here on the show. I, I, I hear, I hear we've solved the dilemma. We've, you know, we, we're, we're, we're the notorious podcast uh, for, for saying inappropriate words, um, inappropriate wake words, I guess I should refer. I mean, maybe we do <laughs> say inappropriate words as well. Um, it's a family friendly show, but yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have to check the explicit tag, but if there was one that was said, Alexa tag, that one's going to get tripped every time. <laughs> yes, it most definitely will. So there's this uh, this thing called Project. Uh, what is it Project Alias? Alias. Okay. Yeah, and they have made a fungus or a virus <laughs> <laughs> to to hack uh, your Amazon or your Google Home, your Amazon Echo, or your Google Home, and and basically what it does, it's it's like a little device that you put on top, and it plays white noise into the microphone of the echo or the google home right so it never hears anything in the room uh until you wake the device up with your own special wake word so if if i wanted to <laughs> if i wanted to name my device you know jason <laughs> and i said you know hey jason it would wake up uh but if i say hey hey google it doesn't do anything um so there you go I actually problem yeah, solved pretty cool yeah this is a this took me a minute to figure this one out i i read this story and we'll include it in the link uh, of our show notes at uh, hometech.fm. A quick read there on Fast Company. Yeah, Project Alias. Uh, Definitely an interesting one. They've got a really entertaining video on there. You'll have to uh, take a minute and go check that out. But we're... uh, Custom wake words. That's right. And nobody can ever get on us for overusing the word Alexa ever again. Never, ever again. And and, you know, not playing sounds. Yeah, right. Not playing sounds. And uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Well, we're certainly not going back to the buzzer. (laughs) <laughs> no, we no, we're not going to do that there. ever again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a great show here this week. We were very excited to welcome on a friend of the show, Adam Justice. And Adam joined us to talk about ConnectSense, which is his company that does uh, not only services for other manufacturers, so IoT services for product manufacturers and OEMs, but also they do their own products, which is pretty cool. And they recently released a new Smart Outlet, the Smart Outlet 2 that has support built into it for all of the major platforms, uh, Google, Alexa, as well as HomeKit, and really enjoyed our conversation with Adam. We also jumped into some conversation about CES. He was just out there recently and shared some of his perspectives on that, so be sure to stay tuned. Yep. Well, what do you say we jump into some home tech headlines? Let's do it. Amazon launched the Echo Input, a tiny little box that can connect to any speaker and instantly add hands-free Alexa support. The device looks like a small disc, sports a 3.5 millimeter output for connectivity, and is available now for only $19.99 on Amazon.com. Very interesting. Yep, twenty dollars gets you in, gets you in the door. That's that's killer. I, I mean, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of of that product line, but. Uh, you know, it's very, it's a very good product line for what it is. And for $20, I think it's a great, a great we, deal. We know that about you, Seth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what that, <laughs> but I, I, I wish Google had something like this cause I would use that every day. I have these really no, nice, it's a, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Ikea and Sonos are teaming up to, to design a new line of connected speakers with the Ikea look and feel the Symphonisk, uh, uh, branded devices. Yeah, that's that's IKEA. It's all it all. Caps that's one of the and, easier ones from yeah. IKEA. <laughs> right. Uh, branded devices will be designed by IKEA, but powered by Sonos to bring sound and music into the home in a more beautiful way, according to Bjorn Block, business leader at IKEA Home Smart. The Symphonisk speakers will work alongside any other Sonos speaker and should be available after summer this year. Very interesting. IKEA continuing to uh, make forays into the connected home. So we'll be really interested to see how this one takes shape and how it does in the market. Uh, Moving on here, LG. We've got the Super Bowl coming up, Seth. My Broncos will not be in it this year, to say the least. Uh, But LG is determined to capitalize on what will surely be another uh, busy Super Bowl year with everybody looking to watch the big game. The company has cut prices on its B8 series OLEDs. OLED TVs now through February 2nd. The 55-inch model is down 
to $1,500, which is an $800 discount. And if you need a bigger picture, the 65-inch version is down a full $1,000 discount to $2,300. So some pretty steep discounts on these. Granted, they are, I think, about a year old. These are their older models, but still fabulous TVs. And if you've been holding off on uh, on uh, getting a good OLED from LG, now may be your time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, everything's cheaper the day after you buy it, right? But uh, that's still a pretty good deal. $1,000 off a TV. Uh, why not? According to a report by The Intercept, beginning in 2016, Ring provided its R&D team based in the Ukraine with access to a folder on Amazon's S3 cloud storage service that contained every video created by every Ring camera around the world. The Intercept source said that the video files were left unencrypted because Ring's leadership team felt the encryption would make the company less valuable, quote. Interesting. Due to the expense of implementing encryption and lost revenue opportunities due to restricted access. <laughs> the unencrypted thing is weird. I'm not I'm not terribly sure what that means, but the ring having the video, I mean, duh. <laughs> First of all, duh. Like you you record you don't you read terms of service? Like you're recording these videos. They're they're not stored at your house. They're stored on ring servers. They they own them. They can do what they want with them. And the second thing I thought was weird is, you know, this this story kind of got blown out of proportion was like um, what what the screenshots they provided. I don't know if you can you see on the intercept there, like they provided some screenshots. It's like of this guy's front porch. And it's clearly like one of those machine learning things where you, you train a machine like the, the, the picture in the video is like there's vehicle one, two or let's see, vehicle three, four, five and six and like. It basically says annotate every object, even stationary and obstructive objects, for the entire video. And so, like somebody is training some AI somewhere on what a person is, a vehicle is, a tree is, you know, that kind of thing. And um, that that's completely normal. Where are they going to get this video from? They have all these millions of doorbells out there. Of course, they're going to use video from them. So, right. I, I don't know about you know if, if they weren't. Uh, if they just had it like publicly accessible on a uh, on a S3 bucket somewhere, you know, and, and anybody could have gone and, and gotten that, uh, that's one thing. Uh, whether it's encrypted or not doesn't make a difference. If it's if it's publicly accessible, access accept publicly accessible, then that that's another thing. But it didn't sound like it was. Um, so I don't know. It's it's a very strange thing. Uh, a very very strange story. It sounds like a, a lot to do about nothing. And it, this story certainly made its rounds this last week. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I like Ring. I like what they're doing. Uh, but I, I don't see any problem with this. I don't have any issue with this at all. Uh, there is a, on the Intercept, there's actually an update uh, on January 11th after the publication. Um, Ring spokesperson said Ring employees have never have and never did provide employees with access to live streams of the ring devices. So you can't go in and look at what's going on live, but they could certainly take the recordings, which ring has on their own servers and do what they want with them. And right. They're doing that. I mean, they're, I don't know. This, this story seems a little blown out of proportion for what it is. Yeah, I, I agree, but it got, got us to click on it, right? (laughs) Those privacy stories usually do. You kind of have to read between the lines. Yeah, yeah. Comcast NBC Universal plans to debut a free ad-supported streaming service to anyone who subscribes to traditional pay TV service, including competitors such as Charter, AT&T, Cox, and Dish, in the first quarter of 2020, the company announced on Monday. From those who don't subscribe to a pay TV service, the streaming product will cost somewhere around $12 a month, uh, a person familiar with the company's plans told CNBC. Very interesting. So they, they they want you to pay that what eighty dollar base base price, uh, and you get this for free, uh, just to have the old cable company around, or twelve dollars a month. Interesting. Yeah, I it, it is interesting. The most interesting thing to me is that you can be a subscriber of competitive networks like Cox and Dish, et cetera, uh, and still get it for free. So I'm not sure how the economics work there, or what the business arrangement is. It, it's probably fairly complicated but uh interesting and as we've talked about numerous times just more and more options uh, becoming available for anyone looking to 
get away from strictly using traditional pay TV. So Amazon has announced an update to its base level Fire TV stick, which retails for $40, a great deal on that. Starting now, the base model uh, stick will also come with the Alexa voice remote, allowing buyers to search for their favorite content with their voice rather than having to navigate the menus by hand. So originally this base model did not have voice built into the remote and now it does and it'll still be retailing for $40. So pretty good deal. Yeah, good deal. I unfortunately haven't heard very many positive things about the Fire TV type devices. <laughs> very good, nice things. I, I've, I've never used one. I, I've come across them in the field back when you know the first generation was out, but I haven't heard v- very many nice things about the interface and uh, how it works uh, lately. So I'm hoping that after they get all this, you know, hardware stuff worked out, uh, they, they work a little bit on the interface, but it's Amazon. Don't, so you never know. I know Seth isn't holding his breath. I'm not. Much no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I used one for a, a couple of weeks when I was traveling at my, staying at my in-laws over the holidays. And, uh, you know, I thought it was okay. It wasn't the best interface, but, uh, I, I got used to it pretty quickly. Yeah. So, all right, Seth. Well, that does it for our headlines. What do you say we go ahead and jump into our interview with Adam? All right. All right. So without further ado here, we'll welcome Adam Justice onto the show. Once again, Adam joined us from ConnectSense, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. We'll come back out at the end here with uh, with a few thoughts of our own. Hey, Adam, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. We, uh, we're looking forward to getting you back on the show. I know you've appeared here on Home Tech before, and we thought it'd be a great time to to reconnect, coming off the back of CES here, I know you've got some exciting things going on at uh, Connect Sense as well. So we'll look forward to jumping in to all of that and more. But before we do that, uh, for anyone listening to the show who may not be familiar with you or your work in the connected home space, why don't you give us a quick uh, personal introduction? Sure. So Adam Justice, uh, been working in this space for uh, a number of years now. Uh, myself, I got started in technology out of college, uh, working for Accenture, and then uh, and then joined into the networking space, um, joining a, a family business. Uh, our our parent company is called Grid Connect, and it was started by my father. And uh, I've, I'm actually going on uh, next month will be my tenth year uh, with the company. So um, I kind of got some initiatives started. Early on, I saw an opportunity in the market where um, actually in the sensor side of things. And um, so uh, a number of years ago, we we launched some Wi-Fi connected sensors, which was sort of our first go into IoT. The company had long done a number of things in networking technology. So we had proper experience on, on the networking side of things, but we had never really done that full um, integrated product. So um, we really got our start there and uh, I got my taste in, in IoT there. And then uh, from there, we, um, you know, right about the time HomeKit was announced um, was when we were kind of saying what's next for us. And so, um, you may or may not know this about me, but uh, I'm I'm a huge Apple fan just as a as a consumer. And so when HomeKit was announced, I was like, "All right, I want to do something with this." And uh, we came up with a smart plug being a, a place we wanted to work on that, and uh, and then launched the ConnectSense smart plug uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, in addition to uh, our own products, uh, ConnectSense also has worked with a number of different companies um, on the product side. So there are various people that kind of saw the stuff we were doing with our own st- own products and then uh, said, hey, can you help us with that as well? So uh, in addition to our own products, we have kind of the other side of the business where we've helped um, big and small companies add connectivity to their own products. Um, so some examples of this are, are like the Moen smart shower. Um, that's something my team worked on. We helped them with the firmware, the module that powers that as well as the cloud and the apps. And, um, we've continued to work with them for a number of years. So they just made some announcements around HomeKit uh, in a new version of their shower. They're working with Google and Alexa and uh and that we also did some work with schlage locks so their bridge is is a product um 
that we worked on as well as as well as some other companies. So, um, so yeah, while we have our own stuff, we've also kind of worked across the board in all aspects of the smart home. Yeah, no, that's that's a very very cool. Um, I would love to hear just a little bit more. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the smart outlet two that you guys just came out with and get into a little bit more of the connect sense branded product offerings but this work you do with with product manufacturers and with with oems i think is really really interesting so talk about the need there and what i mean by that is you know we see a a ton of products coming to market every day literally in the connected home and the the challenges uh, around developing and you know developing these integrated products as you talked about earlier uh, what are some of the sort of specific areas that you work in and and, and help you mentioned a couple of, of sort of high level examples there but you know what sort of headaches i guess are you solving uh, for the the companies that you work with there on the uh, on the OEM side so yeah um, on the OEM side a lot of these companies um are faced with a challenge. Um, I think Moen's a great example of this and, and probably one of our best success stories. But, you know, they had never done, they'd done very little with electronics, let alone connectivity. So as a company, they were like, all right, we're new to this space. Um, thankfully for them, they were very open to working with outside parties to get this done. You know, a company like that is cha- is has two decisions. They can either try to grow it internally, um, which often takes a lot longer and is faced with more challenges, um, or they can find a partner like us that can help them get there faster and can kind of leverage their experience um, to get there quicker. So I think that's one of the challenges these companies are having to decide is, do we do this ourselves or do we find somebody who has some experience in the space to get it done faster? And then from there, it's it's the challenges are all over the place. Um, you know, we often say hardware is hard, and um, and so there are things like certifications. There are things like uh, you know what cloud platform to use, what you know, Wi-Fi chipset to use, things like that. So that's another thing that these uh, larger and, and smaller companies look to us to help, just kind of. Uh, be their advocate and and help give them advice in all these spaces where they don't have experience. And so we're able to leverage not only our experience um, of doing this before, but also all those relationships that come from that. So, you know, we know all the Wi-Fi chipset guys. Um, We're able to, you know, have conversations with them. We know folks at Google, Apple, Amazon. So we're able to, you know, get you know, knock down barriers in those places too. So um, those are things that our customers get to leverage and, and work with. Right, right. And ConnectSense can help with not only the, uh, not you're, you're saying that you guys have help with not only the software part, part of that, but the hardware, hardware as well? Yeah. So, I mean, we've always been a hardware company first and um, we added on all of the software aspects. So cloud, firmware, apps, as ways to break down barriers um, for our customers. Right. So um, we needed our it ourselves for our own products. Um, but then we also found that somebody who utilizes us for all those things, we're able to work a lot faster. Um, we play well with others too. And some of those, um, some of those products we've worked on, either they have their own app team or they're working with another cloud provider or things like that. And and that's fine, but anytime you have multiple companies at the table, things just generally take longer because there's a lot more coordination and 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 that kind of stuff involved. So um, we do find when we are able to do it all, we can move a lot faster. Right, right. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, connect, your ConnectSense um, products that you have. Um, you mentioned the Smart Outlet earlier. Uh, I know now you have uh, a Smart Outlet Two as well. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, when we launched the Smart Outlet 1, it was a HomeKit only product. And um, that wasn't necessarily the intention. Uh, Initially, we had broader plans for that product. um, But we ran into some limitations on the hardware um, 
specifically the Wi-Fi module of what we could put into that product. So um, ultimately, we knew we had to change out that Wi-Fi chipset if we wanted to add support for the other ecosystems. And also the time we did that, you know, Alexa wasn't even a thing. Um, you know, we wanted to have some cloud backend and stuff like that, but it wasn't as big of a deal when we first launched that original product. Um, so in the background, uh, we've been working on, on the Smart Outlet 2 um, and with the goal of, one, leveraging our, our cloud infrastructure that we have. We're a very close partner with Amazon on the IoT side uh, and AWS. Um, so we wanted to be able to um, leverage the power of that as well as being able to play nice with all the other platforms. So um, with this, we've also added support for um, for Alexa and, and Echo devices as well as Google Home and, and their assistant ecosystem. Very interesting. Are you, are you using the, uh, the AWS IOT stuff, the MQTT, um, or are you using your own like AWS EC2 servers? Just a geeky question to ask, um, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, that's fine. We can yeah. get in the weeds. Uh, yeah. So we are, we are using AWS IOT. Um, we basically have built an entire platform on top of AWS IOT. Yeah. So, um, the way I always phrase it when I talk to people about it is like, Think of AWS as like hardware you'd buy at 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 Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, you know, they're they're the building materials. You still have to come up with the architecture plans and build the house. So we right. built a right. house. We use that house and those plans for our stuff for our customers, as well as um, you know, we also sell that as a as a license to customers as well. So, um, and I think something that's unique about us is other than other service providers in this space is because we have our own products, we live and breathe this stuff ourselves. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where if it's good enough for us, then it's good enough for our customers. And we also know the pains that our customers go through um, by having our own products on this platform. Right. Uh, dog fooding, I think, is the industry term there. <laughs> you eat your own dog food. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we we do a lot of that. So, yeah. And also with this product, we added um, Android support as well. Um, so originally we were iOS only. So now we're able to serve uh, both sides of, of uh, the smart home market um, and then able to maintain uh, a lot of the same features we had in the first one, which is be able to have energy monitoring, um, scheduling, and a lot of the basics that a customer wants in in uh, a smart plug so yeah it's available today uh it is 59 dollars. it's available on amazon as well as on uh, connectsense.com and i'm sure you guys can uh throw those links in the show notes yeah i just put one in the cart so <laughs> there you go uh, yeah this this is a pretty cool um pretty cool product and at 59 dollars for two controllable outlets and you said it has energy monitoring in it as well um that sounds like a great deal uh, oh, and the you don't forget the two USB charging ports on the side. Like that's that's somebody thinking <laughs> they're they're designing product. Yes. So yeah, that was our added added bonus. There's a USB charging port, uh, so you can charge a mobile phone or anything else that just uses standard USB charging without taking up one of your sockets. So I've got a quick question um, in regards to uh, the different platforms that you work with. Um, and I don't know how much of this you can answer and how much you can't answer because we've, we've all heard of like all the special NDAs that go around. Um, but you've worked, you've, you said you started with HomeKit uh, when it came out and you work with all three now. Uh, there has been like over the past, uh, over the past, what, two or three years, I guess, Apple has slowly kind of opened up and made it what, what seemed to be made it a little bit easier to work with HomeKit uh, outside of like, if you're trying to develop a product and we heard like when HomeKit first started up, we heard all these stories about how, uh, tough it was to work with Apple to make HomeKit product. Uh, and in the meantime, we saw, uh, Alexa and Google, uh, starting to take off uh, really, really Amazon took off more than anybody. And then Google has been kind of pacing and, and catching up. And I think, I think they're all kind of like, like today we were talking on our CES show, Jason and I were talking about this, like, 
now when I go buy a product, if I didn't see these three badges, like I, I, may, I may not buy it because I expect it to work with HomeKit. I expect it to work with Alexa and I, I expect it to work with Google. Um, how has your experience changed with working with, I mean, Apple, uh, Alexa and Google over, over the past, what, five years? Um, how has it changed b- between these companies? Are they, are they mostly on par now or is, it, is one kind of harder to work with than the other still? Um, yeah, I'm certainly not going to throw anybody under the bus, but I will say <laughs> it's fundamentally different. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the reasons that Amazon and Google have been able to move so quickly is because they're cloud-based um, integration. So um, by the nature of that, um, it just makes it a lot simpler to integrate with them. Um, that doesn't mean there's still not a lot of work involved, but... Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to change anything on the actual hardware of the device, whereas Apple is primarily a firmware effort. Um, and so just a different kind of effort um, that usually involves uh, used to be a, a hardware revision because there was the, the chip that you had to put on the device. And now, you know, a- Apple has made that easier and there's other options out there in the market. So. I think it's just different, and I think with those differentiations are different advantages to each platform. Um, you know, one of the huge advantages to HomeKit that I don't think a lot of people talk about is the fact that it's talking on your local network. And, um, you know, the integration that comes with the Home app and and tightly with all the other Apple hardware and things like that. And so, um, you know... The, the other platforms have done a ton to make that latency of those requests super, super minimal. Um, but I guess depending on where you live in the world and what your Internet's like and um, things like that, you may see a different experience there. Um, the other one that I think makes a big difference is just the privacy implications as well. I had a really interesting conversation um, with somebody from another smart home vendor who had decided to go all in on HomeKit and very was anti um, anything that required a cloud connection. And so, you know, I think often we think about our own kind of uh, state in the U.S. and kind of how we view technology. And we all seem to be very whatever with uh, giving Amazon and Google all of our data and signing up our accounts and stuff with them. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily feel that way. And Apple has taken a really, really hard stance on privacy. And so for some people, that's that aligns with kind of what they're interested in signing up for from a smart home perspective. And that's, you know, they they don't want their data in the cloud. They don't want to give access to to those other ecosystems uh, for that. So I think that's kind of a interesting thing to consider. But. I totally agree with you that um, I know on my own purchases, I look for stuff that has all three as well. And it's actually a smaller club than you'd think. Uh, You know, there's a lot of people that do just Amazon and Google now, um, but not a a ton that can do all three. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, um, I, I, when, when, when HomeKit came out, the, what, not, not so much the security aspect of it. I think that's kind of like a, a topic that's kind of organically grown over the past couple of years, um, maybe the last two or three years. But when HomeKit came out, what did uh, excite me was that it was locally controlled. And and I think the bigger thing for me is actually that I didn't have to use, no offense, like I'm sure you guys have an app. Maybe you don't have an app. I don't know. But I didn't have to use a third a third party app to control everything. I could, I, and if I didn't like Apple's app, I could put another app on top of HomeKit and, and use that. Um, or I can make my own app. Like they, they, they complete, completely opened up the interface um, to be used by you know third party app applications outside of like the you know the the quick launch thing uh, where you swipe down and get to it from that way. Um, but like if I if I wanted a different interface for the house, I didn't have to use one vendor's app. I could it, it all kind of summarized everything in one spot. And I, I I thought that was genius because the database is actually on the phone rather than you know in the cloud or or somewhere else. So. Uh, yeah. Definitely like no, that. we we do have an app, um, but as a as manufacturer of devices, I don't really care if you use it. Uh, I just want you to have a great experience, and wherever you're going to have that experience, however that is, um, 
it works for me. So, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. That's definitely an advantage there. And I think now with voice and things like that, um, you know, I, I think manufacturers can always offer unique features in their app and there's going to be things you're going to want to go to the manufacturer's app for. Um, but you know, if we're doing our job right, you shouldn't have to go to the app for everything. Right. Right. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump back in here. I feel I'm kind of the dumb guy in the room, so I wanted to let you guys geek out on the on the hardware side. But no, it all, a lot of great observations there. I particularly enjoyed hearing your perspectives about the different platforms and the pros and cons there. I think that's really uh, some great insights. And like you said, some things that not everybody thinks about, right? Like the privacy thing, I think, is a great example. And Apple's become more vocal about that. But that's been a, kind of a slow and steady drumbeat from them, I think. And you're starting to see that crescendo uh, a little bit for obvious reasons. It's a it, it's a competitive advantage for them, and and presumably uh, something that that is attractive to to a, to a lot of people. But uh, shifting gears a little bit here, and we wanted to spend a little a little bit of time with you. We know you were just out at CES. Seth alluded to it a moment ago. We did our CES wrap up show uh, recently here, and another busy show, of course. CES is known for that, and this year was no exception. Uh, so let's dive into that and just just talk about your sort of your personal experience uh, out there and, and how did the show treat you? Yeah, uh, I mean, it is always a total grind for us. Uh, it's a busy, uh, busy time. And we've been doing it the last five years. Like you said, um, we've we're kind of a, a, a come up story. We started in the in the initial I think it was the very first year of the Eureka Park, which was like one aisle of booths. Uh, and we just had a little stand up there. Uh, now we've grown to be, we do a 20 by 20 in the smart home area and, uh, it's always a very busy, exhausting week. So thankfully I've had a little bit of time to catch up on my sleep, um, since being out there. Um, but yeah, it's always a great opportunity, um, to get in front of consumers, uh, customers, folks from the industry, um, and show off whatever we're doing that's new as well as get a chance to uh you know talk to various partners and uh and friends in the industry so i think overall um it was a good year we had some good quality conversations and traffic and um and yeah um i think from a smart home perspective uh because i never get to leave the sands um Unfortunately, right. we're just always so busy and slammed between that and meetings that uh, I'm lucky if I get a chance to kind of go and look at all the booths in the smart home area. But um, just walking around, I didn't see a ton of new stuff. I, I feel like, um, you know, we all expect there every year to show up and see these massive new innovations. But the, the reality of this industry is the slow, um, steady stuff always moving forward um so i it, in that way i didn't see anything earth shattering this year um i was impressed with some of the new stuff um from ring and some of the stuff they're doing um our friends at schlage of course put out a new wi-fi lock um so interested to follow where that goes um and yeah just a bunch of stuff moving forward little by little Right. Yeah. The, we when not uh, when we went to Cedia this last year. Uh, it's something that Jason and I picked up on is that it felt like there were there weren't any earth shattering things this year. We just kind of had like everybody was there. They were showing off their product. They were showing off what you know what things they've added onto it. But it felt like a very not, not so much a plateau, but like we, we've gotten here. We've gotten everybody on board <laughs> with with the smart home. Let's like iterate on the product. And it felt like felt like it was more of an iterative year than it was um, like an earth shattering year. Like you were saying, I think that kind of fell into CES. Um, if, you know, if 8K TVs on it or 16K TVs don't excite you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think last year, the big story was, you know, Google kind of going big and they were in everybody's booth and they had their people all over the place. And, and they did that to some extent again this year. Um, I think we saw a a bigger presence from Amazon this year as well. They had a nice big room right outside the sands, kind of showing all the ways um, you can work with um, the Echo ecosystem. And um, 
and, and just that. So, um, you know, we saw, you know, support from all of our ecosystem partners. We were showing off voice in our booth um, with all all of the smart speakers. Um, so that was kind of fun this year and, and good to get participation from our partners to uh, to help support those kinds of demos. And yeah, it was uh, it was just generally a, a good solid year and um, good to always see everything moving forward. Uh, you know, even at a, a slower pace, but uh, but the industry being alive and, and lots of new stuff going on. Yeah, definitely, and I I, I can relate to that. I have gone to CDF for many years and and only just in the last couple of years have moved over onto the vendor side of, of the industry and working with one vision and not getting to see a whole lot of the show floor, right? Lucky if I get to spend an an hour or two is, is really lucky. Um, so it's hard. It's hard to get the, uh, the perspectives. Uh, Seth and I both watched CES from afar this year and in years past and observed some of the same things, obviously big developments in TV, uh, 8k next year, it'll be 16k and who knows. Uh, right. So TV is always a big story out of CES, but from a smart home perspective, I agree. Uh, Google, Amazon, big presence, a lot of Apple stories in the press this year, more so I felt like at least than in years past, it felt like they made a little bit of a push. Um, so that was cool to see and ring doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, but beyond the big headline grabbers, like those guys, uh, I agree with you just kind of that uh, slow and steady march, right? Which I think is typically the case at these trade shows. We we always go in looking for the big story, but most most years are are really about that slow and steady progress, and you get those rare uh, rare exceptions. So cool. Well, uh, you know, we're, let's run it up against our time a little bit here, and we want to start to close out and and talk about uh, looking forward. You know what uh, what is next for ConnectSense? What are you guys getting really excited about as we as we enter twenty nineteen? So uh, our big thing we were showing off at CES this year was our in-wall outlet, and that's a product we're um, very excited about this year. Um, you know, I think we learned a lot with our, our first two smart outlets that are in the market, and we've taken that um, that knowledge and just kind of ramped it up to really deliver um, what we feel is a, a premium experience in, in an in-wall product. So... Um, our team uh, coming out of CES is working really hard to get that product out the door. Um, our goal is to to ship that in the second half of the year, and um, that's something we're really excited about. So um, from a capability perspective, that product has um, kind of the way I phrase it, if, uh, if the Smart Outlet 2 uh, had standard definition power monitoring, the in-wall outlet has high definition power monitoring. So we're really focused on being able to let customers be informed about how they're using power and, and do some really great things with that. So, um, you know, I think for for kind of your audience and, and the Cedia world, um, we're really interested to work with installers and that kind of those kinds of folks on that product and, and getting it in people's hands. So um, certainly for the audience of this show, um you know, I'll give my information at the end, but we definitely want to hear from from your guys's kind of audience and, and the folks in that in that world about what they're looking for in a, in a product like the the Inwall outlet. So, sure. um, you know, we're we're working on kind of putting the wraps on it, but we're we want to do that in such a way that we're really listening to the market and you know what customers want, but also you know we we know that installers are a customer in and of themselves too. So. We have some cool stuff uh, that we're planning that we think are going to make those kind of folks excited as well. Cool. Very cool. Well, that segues into uh, perfectly into our final question here, Adam. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And if our listeners did want to connect with you and and or find out more about ConnectSense and all of your work there, what would be the best way for them to do that? Sure. So you can find me on Twitter at Adam Justice. Uh, find out about the products at ConnectSense.com. Or if you want to email me, I'm Adam at ConnectSense.com. All right. Well, we really appreciate it, Adam. Thanks for coming on and, and don't be a stranger. All right. Of course. And thanks for having me. You got it. Take care. All right. Well, that does it for our interview with Adam. And I, I really enjoyed it. Learned Learned a lot about what he's been up to. And I think one of the particular areas that I was interested in was as I alluded to during the interview, was hearing him talk about, you know, developing for all of the different platforms, right? And we've talked about on the show, you mentioned during the interview that really 
having these voice platforms built into products is is sort of table stakes now. But you know, the comment he made about a lot of products are, and it got me to thinking, a lot of products are developed for Google and for the Echo platform, but you don't see as many, now that I think about it, developed for all three, you know, HomeKit, Echo, and Google. So uh, some interesting observations there, and also enjoyed his commentary about Apple and privacy and how you're continuing to see them sort of push in that direction. And uh, I think that's becoming more and more valid as as these companies just become so ubiquitous, these platforms, I should say, become so ubiquitous in the home. I think that's a, that's a growing concern for for many people. Yep, uh, especially in light of the, the the ring, you know, things that we talked about this week. And I, I know there's there's another story floating around that we, we didn't really touch on, but like Vizio was talking about, they basically use their TV uh, TVs to spy on you to to subsidize TVs. So like there's there's a lot of privacy concerns <laughs> and and things you didn't even know about that were spying on you uh, to 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 pay for products. So it's it's very interesting. There uh, it will be very interesting to see where all that stuff heads on in the future. I, wanted, I do want to thank Adam again for his time to come on the show and chat with us about uh, uh, the Connect Sense. And uh, I definitely like that that outlet. And I'm very interested in the, the outlet he's coming out with, the in-wall outlet. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I'll echo what you said there, Seth. And thank you, Adam, for coming on the show. We appreciate you taking some time out. If you're interested in learning more about any of the links or stories we've talked about on this episode, all of that can be found at our on our show notes at hometech.fm slash 241. Once again, that's hometech.fm slash 241. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter, which includes uh, occasional updates here, weekly show reminders, and uh, other fun stuff here from the world of home tech. So head on over to hometech.fm and sign up for that newsletter. Don't forget, you can join us in the chat room live Wednesday, starting somewhere around 7 to 7.30 Eastern, a little early tonight. Uh, you can find out more at hometech.fm slash live. Yep, absolutely. All right, Seth. Well, I think we had uh, something in the mailbag this week we wanted to dive into. We did. We we got uh, a little bit of feedback from uh, from a listener named Scott. Uh, and he, he this is around a discussion we were having about everyone striving towards input zero. And uh, Scott made a pretty interesting point, and I, I wanted to kind of talk about it with you on, 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 the, TV, on, on uh, the show tonight. He said, I need to disagree with the benefits of striving for input zero uh, by virtue of running solely on apps baked into your TV. This is a really bad situation uh, to have as a goal, uh, since not only are the CPUs, RAM, etc., and TVs anemic to begin with, but they become quickly outdated extremely, I mean, sorry, but they become outdated extremely fast. Uh, think of your phone. People get fed up and want to upgrade the phone every two years or so due to the app performance. Now imagine if you started with the lowest end phone to begin with. Uh, that's what you're getting in with these, quote, smart TVs. Uh, do you really want to upgrade your whole TV every two years because Netflix or Plex app now run like molasses uh, just for the sake of input zero? Um, so I, he goes on to talk about, you know, having a, a 75 inch TV costing $1,600 and a Roku costing under a under hundred dollars. So it makes sense to swap out. What he's saying is it makes sense to swap out uh, that device uh, rather than have the apps rely solely right. on the apps TV. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, it's great. I mean, it's a, a great observation. I think maybe a slight difference in, in how Scott is defining input zero or maybe how he thinks at least I define it. Um, you know, to me, input zero is not, it doesn't necessarily mean the app is baked into your TV. And I completely agree with Scott. I'm totally averse, generally speaking, to relying on the apps that are built in to TVs for all of the reasons that, that you've listed here. To, to me, input zero is just more about like, what is that default, the one box to rule them all, right? Like the, everybody's trying to be that one input that we all default to. And for years and years and years, for the vast majority of people, that was cable. Oh, you know, and before that, it was broadcast TV. And now it's like there's this whole new generation of streaming devices and all kinds of different ways to consume content through various apps and subscriptions and over the air. And uh, at the end of the day, like, what is the device that you're going to use as your default to aggregate all of that? And that may be a box, like he's, he goes on to say, Having a, a single HDMI plugged into your TV is hardly the end of the world. Totally agree. I think that, to me, is where I see our house going here person, on a personal level uh, for the foreseeable future, right? It's a TV mounted on the wall and uh, an Apple TV or a Roku tucked behind the TV. 
uh, and that's it, right? Very simple. And so to me, input zero is less about having it actually baked into the TV, although we've certainly talked about that on the show, you know, the days where you'll be able to just plug the TV into the network and and call it a day. But yeah, to me, input zero is more of a, more of a concept related to what's going to be that, that sort of default device uh, that you end up using. Yeah, I, I think right now it is, but I'm going to put this to the infinite timescale argument on an infinite timescale. What do you think? Like you, you, you play this out five years, you play this out 10 years. Um, the apps are going to be on the TV. You're not going to have plug-in devices. And I mean, that's, the long and short of it, I think that's where we're headed. <laughs> yeah, quite um, possibly. Right now, I think the Roku is way better than the uh, than the than the apps on the TV for sure, hands down. And I can swap that out as it needs to get better. But there's going to come to a point where the the software inside these TVs is going to be as good as it needs to be to deliver the services that that need to be on the TV, right? So in the in the, in the video, like they're, they're going to be they're pretty good right now. Um, I I don't think upgrading every, you know, every so often is going to be, I think w- once these services get settled out, I think you're going to have a minimum spec that you're going to need to meet uh, to get, you know, like 4k video into the TV and play it on the screen. But I don't, I, I don't think you're going to need to swap out a box every, I think, I think, I don't think you're going to need that to swap out a R- Apple TV or a Roku or whatever every, you know, so often. I, I think the processors are going to be fine. I think the computers inside will be just fine. Um, and you know, what it'll come down to is maybe a service or some type of application that lays on top of the TV that, that basically gets streamed into your TV where, you know, you plug into the wall and you get it on the, on online somehow, or maybe that's part of plugging into the wall. I don't know. And, uh, you know, the interface just gets streamed in, you know, along with everything else. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I that's kind of what I was wondering. Yeah. I think this day right now, I think he's absolutely right. Like why would I go out and, and rely solely on these, these TVs, uh, especially in light of them spying on me, <laughs> Whoa, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, why would I rely on the TV apps? I think, I think he makes an excellent point. Um, but I do think that's where manufacturers are headed, you know, that input zero. And I think we'll be there f- sooner than you, s- sooner than you think. I think it's, it's right around the corner maybe within five years uh, we'll have the ability to plug in and have all the apps we need there. And then we're just coming out of the TV uh, into an amplifier to do surround sound and that kind of right. thing. So um, I, don't, I don't think we're that far off. It may be within a year that we're, that's like starts to be considered to be the norm. All right. Well, you heard it here first, first prediction of the year. Yep. Th- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was good. Good email. Thank yeah, you, Scott. Um, it, I, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with you right now. This is this is how it looks right now. But I think in the future, we're 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 going to look at this differently and, and think about this differently. Yeah. Time will tell. All right. Well, uh, like you said, Seth. Thank you, Scott, for taking the time to send that. We really appreciate it. Moving on here, we've got a, a pick of the week, and a lot of people have probably seen this already. I mean, it's been all over the internet, and it's. Uh, I think this was in the Bay Area. Yeah, Salinas, California. I think it's up near. San Francisco and uh, a guy a guy walks up to a door and he lo- sees that clearly he sees the camera and looks right in the camera and then goes over to a doorbell on an adjacent wall and proceeds to start licking the doorbell while he continues to look into the camera in front of him. It's very creepy. Uh, supposedly the guy did it for like three hours straight. Uh, and of course, whoever got the footage sent it out and it's totally gone viral. Uh, so if you want a good laugh, uh, definitely go check this one out. It's, uh, it's a little disturbing, but funny all the same. Oh man, the, the image on the, uh, that story is moving now. Like it, it's, <laughs> they looped a gif and the guy is just going to, t- wow. I mean, so he started around four at 5 AM. Either he was really drunk or, or, you know, on uh, something yeah i gotta be on something i i don't know how you <laughs> i mean it'd be weird enough if you did it for like 10 seconds but he did it for like three hours all right well there you go i mean that's yeah i guess i, guess, <laughs> I like this <laughs> three hours is a long time i mean think about that the <laughs> I, yeah i'm uh i'm thinking about it 
Wow. The individual, uh, let's see, what was funny is the police department said they were able to identify uh, the suspect because the footage is especially clear. Like he's sitting there looking right it into is, it. It is very clear, that is for sure. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so anyways, that's a good one. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, definitely go check that out. Hometech.fm slash 241. If you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for a show, uh, give us a shout. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can visit hometech.fm and feedback and fill out the online form like Scott did there. Absolutely. And as we always do, we want to take this opportunity to give a big thank you to everybody who supports our show, and especially to those of you who support us financially through our Patreon page. If you're not familiar or you want to learn more, head on over to hometech.fm slash support where you can learn how to support our efforts here at the podcast for as little as one dollar a month Uh, any pledge over five dollars we'll give you a big shout out on air but every single pledge gets an invite to our private slack chat the hub where you and other supporters of the show can gather every day for the inside baseball conversations about all things home technology and slack is great but the app icon is not we're so sorry we are so sorry for that i'm not sure what's going on unbelievable (laughs) Um, we 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 can only do so much, and uh, you know, we can't we can't change the Slack icon. So sorry. That's it. Well, Jason, I think that wraps up uh, the show for this week. Uh, I think guess we'll come back next week and sit down and talk about what happened in the week's news. Yep, absolutely. Look forward to uh, reconnecting with you. Have a great week, and we'll talk soon. Yep, have a good weekend. All right, take care. Mm-hmm.